growth mindset is one of the most important things you can learn. Because when you master these ideas, what happens is that every aspect of your life starts getting better and better and better. Professor Rao once came to me after a talk and he goes, these MBA schools produce graduates that think that the most important thing in their life is their career and their business. They attach their identity to the idea of being in business and this is wrong. The most important thing is not your business. The most important thing is are you growing? If your business does a billion dollars, doesn't matter. Did you grow? If your business collapses, it doesn't matter. Did you grow? Your business is nothing more than the universe giving you the most important vehicle for you to grow. The Emirati government asked me to create a program for civil servants here in the country on growth mindset. Now, growth mindset is a really interesting topic. And when they first asked for this, I'm like, what? This, this sounds way too academic. Can't I talk about something that I'm more excited about, like 10x or Silva method? But it turned out that growth mindset is one of the most important things you can learn. Because when you master these ideas, what happens is that every aspect of your life starts getting better and better and better. Now, let me tell you what happened to me. About a year ago, I was part of a WhatsApp group of founders and CEOs. And we have this WhatsApp group because it was started during the pandemic for founders and CEOs, around 80 of us, to support each other as we went through all of this disruption during the pandemic. And one day I get this letter. It was a message in the WhatsApp group from a fellow founder that I knew. And this is basically what he said. He said, guys, I've sunk to a new low and I don't know if this time I can pull myself out. Basically, because of the pandemic, I started working from home. I stopped being able to work and see the members of my team. I couldn't go out and even have a drink with my friends. That loneliness really affected me because I'm a social butterfly and I started sinking into sadness. That sadness seemed to affect my ability to perform at work, which means I just couldn't get everything I needed done in that amount of time I had per day. This led to me making promises to my clients that I couldn't deliver. So I overpromised to get even more clients to meet the shortfall in revenue. This caused some really, really, really huge pro tro troubles in my company. I began to see sales dwindle this caused stress. I snapped at my wife one day and that was it. We're now in not having a really good love affair anymore. Worse, I began to lose time that I'd otherwise spend with my children. And he said, and to sum it all up, I feel that I've sunk into a negative spiral and I don't know if I can pull myself out. One tiny trigger, the pandemic, created this spiral that caused this guy to go lower and lower and lower. Now, these negative spirals are real. When you fall into a negative spiral, this is from a website called mindmypeelings.com, the negativity creates more negativity. And I bet some of you have been there. I've been there. We've all been there. Now, a growth mindset is the opposite of this. A growth mindset is where you're spiraling upwards. And because you're spiraling upwards, even if there is a black swan event, like a pandemic, it may cause you to drop a few notches, but it doesn't devastate you. Growth mindset is one of the most powerful insurance policies you can have for your life. Now, the first issue that people have with the growth mindset is that they don't understand this concept of how if we are not moving upwards, we are slowly going to move downwards, right? But the second thing is, people don't seem to understand that you can have it all. This would probably get, in my mind, an award for the stupidest tweet ever made. And it's from Randy Zuckerberg, Mark Zuckerberg's sister. And again, no disrespect to Randy, we're talking about the tweet here. But she said, the entrepreneur's dilemma, maintaining friendship, building a great company, spending time with family, staying fit, getting sleep, pick three. This is dumb. Because I can tell you, if you can only do three of that, it's not because it's impossible, it's because you just haven't bothered to go into a growth mindset. At Mind Valley, we ask you to pick 12. And we say you can be excellent in all 12. These are the 12 categories of life book. But if I go back 20 years ago, 
I would have believed this rubbish. Please don't believe this. Now, how do you go from this idea that you can only succeed in three areas of life to the idea that you can succeed in 12, and not only succeed in 12, but continuously spiral upwards in all 12? This is where growth mindset comes in. So two important things. You're going on an upward spiral and you are spiraling up, not just in one area, not just in terms of your wealth, or not just in terms of your health, but in all areas. Now, there are five key ideas for a growth mindset, and I want to give that to you in the 35 minutes that we have. You guys ready? The first one is the idea of knowing your number one mission. This is a quote from my book, your soul isn't here to achieve, your soul is here to grow. Most people get this wrong. They become seduced by success and broken by failure. What I mean by this is really a rule that I call the Rao rule. So back to Professor Sri Kumar Rao, right, who's been a huge influence on Mind Valley. Professor Rao once came to me after a talk and he said, Vision, the problem with all of these top MBA schools, whether it's Harvard or it's Stanford, is that they do not teach the most important thing. And I asked him, what's the most important thing? He goes, consciousness. And I go, but Rao, they do. They do teach consciousness. And he goes, no, no, you're misunderstanding. They teach ethics. Ethics and consciousness are two different things. After the Enron scandal, all of these schools teach ethics. Consciousness is different. It's something bigger. So I said, explain. And he goes, these MBA schools produce graduates that think that the most important thing in their life is their career and their business. They attach their identity to the idea of being in business, and this is wrong. He went on to say, the most important thing is not your business. The most important thing is, are you growing? If your business does a billion dollars, doesn't matter, did you grow? If your business collapses, it doesn't matter, did you grow? Your business is nothing more than the universe giving you the most important vehicle for you to grow. Your business, it's not about its success or failure. Detach from that. Your business, rather, is your gym. It's your training ground. It teaches you how to lead. It teaches you how to produce a product. It teaches you how to navigate the complexities of the economy. Your business is your gym. Now, when you go to a gym and you walk out of that gym and you feel all oh, that your body is aching and you wake up the next day and because of lactic acid buildup, your muscles are aching, does that mean you failed at the gym? No. You sometimes have to break a certain part of yourself to grow. Same thing happens with businesses. So the Rao rule is simply this. The number one thing in your life, the number one thing is growth. Growth should be the number one cause that you dedicate yourself to. When you adopt growth as the number one thing in life, everything else grows with you. When we practice the act of becoming a newer, better, more experienced, wiser version of ourselves repeatedly every single day through the practice of personal growth, everything else in life gets elevated. Now, Rao goes even further. He says, your number one thing is not your marriage. Your number one thing is not your children. If you practice growth as the number one thing, you will become the best parent you can be. Why? Because you stop winging it. You start maybe reading Shafali Sabari's book. You will become the best, the best spouse you can be, the best family member you can be, the best friend you can be, because you're constantly seeking to become better and better, and everything else grows with you. So the word I want you to remember is your rose, your rate of self-evolution. How fast are you growing? And the answer should be this. Grow so fast that your friends who haven't kept in touch with you for a month have to get to know you all over again. Now, here's a simple exercise I want you guys to do. How much time do you make for personal growth every day? The best people I know who are really crushing it at life, they spend hours a day on personal growth. I've spent time with people like Richard Branson, and I've seen how he wakes up at 6 a.m. in the morning to swim five kilometers, because that swim is his way as a man in his 70s to, to grow his health and his wellness. The best people spend hours on personal growth. How much are you spending? So what is personal growth time? It's time in the gym. It's time meditating. It's time where you're learning. This is the one people forget. They forget to make 20 minutes a day of learning time. So yeah, 20 minutes of exercise, amazing. 20 minutes of meditation or prayer, amazing. Are you spending 20 minutes a day on, say, the Mind Valley app 
just going through a lesson. And by the way, all the lessons in the Mind Valley app are 20 minutes. Now, when you stack these together, you go through incredible growth. So, I want to ask you to do something right now. Open up your phone and just pick, create a recurring event on your calendar to dedicate 20 minutes a day to practice growth. Now, we're not talking about meditation. We're not talking about exercise. Keep doing that. We're talking about growth as in growing yourself through study, introspection, reflection. This could be journaling. It could be reading a book. It could be being on Mind Valley. It could be watching a TED Talk. Open up your phone right now and just schedule it. And I'll tell you why. You don't have to overthink this. You can always delete the calendar event tomorrow. You can reschedule it. So for me, when I wake up in the morning, it's 20 minutes of the six phase. And then when I make my first cup of coffee, rather than go straight to my computer, I sit down in front of my TV, I open up the Mind Valley app, and I watch a 20 minute lesson. And I drink my coffee with that lesson. This is, I call this my Mind Valley time. I'd like to ask you guys to open up your phone right now and just schedule your Mind Valley time. Could we get one minute, please? Now, make it a recurring event, Monday to Friday. Some people do it in the morning before they go to work, and a lot of you work from home right now, so it's even easier. Some people do it after they come home from work. You can even schedule this, by the way, during your commute, through listening to podcasts or listening to Mind Valley as an audio while you're commuting. Now, just put it in right now. You don't have to overthink it. You can always delete it later if you disagree with me. But as we go deeper into this session tomorrow, you're going to understand why this is so important. And this little marker on your calendar is going to serve you as a reminder on Monday for everything that you're learning here and how to implement it into your life. I'm going to give you that homework tomorrow. Okay, now let's go on to idea number two. Idea number two is to understand that the education system has really done you a disservice, and it's continuing to do so. And it's because it teaches transformation, but not knowledge. Now, no disrespect to the education system. My mom is a former retired public school teacher, and she's, she's sitting here in the audience. I'm not going to point her out, because I know you guys are going to mob her at the party tonight. So, mom, don't stand up. Just hide yourself. But just know that my mom is a public school teacher. She's here. This is not disrespect to teachers. It is an institutional problem. Transformation is an irreversible shift towards a greater understanding of the world. When Sarah got on stage and she spoke about how, through one session with Marissa Peer, she no longer has her allergies, that's transformation. It's irreversible. Knowledge is what you can Google on your smartphone or find on Wikipedia. Knowledge is that the Battle of Hastings happened in 1066. Knowledge is the amount of annual rainfall that the UAE gets. Knowledge is useful but it's not as profound as transformation. Our school teach system, though, does not teach transformation. There's not enough lessons on mindfulness or entrepreneurship or productivity or focus or compassion or social skills in our schools. We all know this. It's an institutional problem that we have to fix, but that's a different conversation. Transformation is what truly changes our lives. But for most people, transformation is unpredictable and it's slow because, according to the University of Toronto, these are the two triggers for transformation. The first is called a disorienting dilemma. This is a crisis. Something bad happens, and then it causes you to shift. In Sarah's case, it was a gut allergy, which meant she couldn't eat many of the foods that normal people ate. She meets Marissa Peer. She goes through hypnotherapy, which is a transformational modality. She changes, and now she has a new understanding of the world and her body. But it happened because of a disorienting dilemma, in Sarah's case, developing an allergy. It turns out that for so many of us, this dilemma, a health issue, is one of the triggers for transformation. But the dilemma could be heartbreak, it could be a business failure. Now, the second cause is slow, gradual accumulation of evolving meaning schema over time. And this is just a fancy academic way of saying wisdom. You get wiser. But for most people, this wisdom comes slowly because they're not deliberate about their learning time. They aren't putting 20 minutes in their calendar every Monday to Friday to dive into a book or a TED Talk or Mind Valley. They just live life being busy. And this is really stupid. 
We'll go deeper into this. Because of this, most people, transformation is painful and slow. You gotta be, you gotta have the universe punch you in the gut and break something, whether it's your health or your relationship, for you to wise up. Or it is slow because you are slow to dive into learning. And thus, for the vast majority of people, transformation is never guaranteed. Now, this isn't true for you guys because a lot of you guys invested your time and your money to be here, and we are so appreciative. You guys are taking an effort towards deliberate transformation. Give yourself a round of applause. This is awesome. But no, you are a tiny slice of the world today. So the important thing is one must seek deliberate transformation. Now, how do you seek deliberate transformation? Well, you can guarantee it by following these five principles in your life, okay? So this is a transformational model that we use at Mindvalley. This model, these five steps of transformation are how we engineer every single program at Mindvalley. If you understand this, you will understand why Marissa Pierre is effective. You will understand what Jim Quick is going to do on stage tomorrow. You will understand how I put together a talk. I'm actually giving you the secret code of Mindvalley. There are five things that cause human transformation. Now, the first thing is this, critical reflection. Critical reflection is a meaning-making process that allows you to reflect on what in your life is going right versus wrong and then making a change. Now, remember I asked you to put that time slot on your phone? That was a form of critical reflection. Because when you look at your phone, because some of you are going, oh, I already have my 20-minute time. Some of you are going, hmm, I don't have my 20-minute time. You are critically reflecting on are you allocating time for your growth? It turns out critical reflection is the number one determinant of human transformation. Now, and Dr. Shafali uses this. Remember when she got on stage, she kept giving examples that many of you here as parents, particularly Indian parents, can relate to. She gave examples that made you understand and reflect on how you behaved with your children as an adult. That's critical reflection. She wasn't poking you, but through her stories, I bet many of you went, oh God, I, I did do that. She's getting you to reflect on your behavior and thus level up into a new behavior. Now, the second thing is critical study and writing. Now, this means deliberately making an effort to not just read or study, but read or study what matters. And this tends to be psychology, anthropology, neuroscience, biohacking, spiritual practices, aspects of personal growth that actually improve you as a human being. Yes, it can be really fun to read a Bill Bryson book on travel and adventure, but it's not gonna make you a better human, it's just entertainment. But when you go into personal growth, what you study maximizes your output. So, look at Mind Valley, right? Everything in Mind Valley is about critical study and reflection. Every quest ends with a reflective question. What did you learn? Write this down. Journal this thought. Think back to a time in the past. Now, this brings us to number three, social discourse. It turns out that we transform really fast when we share our transformation with other people. Remember when I was interviewing Sarah? I mentioned that when me and Sarah have dinner, she drops wisdom bombs. Now, I organize these dinners and I bring together inspiring people like Sarah and we, we debate, we talk about life, we talk about what we're going through and it helps each other transform. When I get on my podcast recordings, we had a recording with Nusser and we debated philosophy of work. We helped each other transform. This is called social discourse. So, the new part of Mindvalley that you're going to notice, and you will see this if you go to meetups.mindvalley.com, is that now we are creating community groups around the world. There were 1,000 meetup events in the last 90 days alone on Mindvalley. And any of you can go and create your own meetup event following this event. You can go and invite other Mind Valley members to come together for lunch, just like I do with Sarah. You can create a meetup event where people come together and go through a quest together and then you discuss what you're experiencing, and this actually elevates transformation. As a bonus, you also end up making some really good friends. So look for the community aspects of Mind Valley. Now fourth is rate of application. When you learn something, you apply it. So remember I asked you to put that thing on your phone? That was an example of rate of application. I'm getting you to do it now. Literally today, before this session is over, 
you put a calendar item in your phone to remind yourself to create transformation time. The faster you can apply something, the faster you're going to grow. So if you look at any Mind Valley program, you are asked to apply that idea immediately. People who have a 24-hour rate of application are going to be more successful. My advice to you today is look at your notes today before you go to sleep, before you go to that party tonight if you have, if you are a VIP ticket holder. Reflect on your notes and ask yourself, what are a couple of things I can apply immediately tomorrow that is going to change the way I show up as a human being? Now, the final one, okay, by the way, Jim Quick, he uses rate of application super fast. When you see Jim Quick talk, you instantly learn tools and you apply them as you're sitting down. He will teach you memory techniques while you're, while you're directly on that seat. This is rapid rate of application. Now, finally, we come to altered states. Altered states is hypnosis, breath work. It is meditation. The sixth phase is altered states. Silva method is altered states. Hypnotherapy by Marissa Pierre or Paul McKenna is altered states. Breath work by Niraj Naik, who is here in the audience, the number one breath work teacher in the world, is also a form of altered state training. So when Marissa Pierre guides you into hypnotherapy, she's not talking to your logical mind. She's talking to a different aspect of your mind that is maybe taking on different beliefs and ideas. And she's removing the beliefs that are not serving you. That was key idea two, the five practices of, of transformation. So now we go to the third point. To go into a growth mindset, first, you must make growth your number one priority. You must embrace that attitude. Number two, you must understand the five practices of how we grow. Create more time for critical reflection, for social discourse, for journaling. Practice altered states like meditations. There are so many of those in the Mind Valley app and so on. But the third thing is, you must reframe failure. And the UAE is 65% South Asian, okay? And the, the rest of it is a lot of people of Arabic culture and Asian culture. And unfortunately, in these cultures, which is the culture I, I come from, failure is very, very, very painful. Because in Asian culture, in Arabic culture, these are shame-based cultures. You see, Western culture is a guilt-based culture. Guilt was a tool by the church to make money. And so if you did something wrong, you, had, you would pray to God for forgiveness, but it was between you and God. That's the Western model. But on the other side of the Bosphorus, it's a shame-based culture. It's more community level, and if you do something wrong, the community ostracizes you. This is why, for example, you look at divorce rates in India, it's 3%. And it's not because Indians have happier marriages. It's because they are so shameful of divorce that they stay in an unhappy marriage. When me and Christina, for example, had our conscious uncoupling and turned it into a celebration, so many Indian people wrote to me saying, my husband abuses me, but I still cannot leave him because my in-laws and my parents would never forgive me. It's horrible. It's a shame-based culture, but the same thing that keeps you stuck in a, in a marriage that isn't working can keep you stuck in a life that isn't working because you fear failure so much, you are afraid to start your next business. I failed with three companies before I started Mind Valley. My dad lent me $30,000. I lost all of it because I did not choose to go into the idea being, feeling ashamed for my losses. This allows you to be a risk taker. And if you can take risk, you will grow faster. So you gotta reframe failure. As the Rumi said, O ye who cannot take a good rub, how will you ever become a polished gem? Now, remember the idea of Kensho and Satori? You can actually reframe failure to be something that's positive. Kensho moments are painful moments that actually give you a new meaning schema of the world, so you simply become better. Satori is true insight, but Kensho can be really, really powerful. How many of you here are entrepreneurs? Raise your hand if you, if you employ people. Okay, here's a really cool thing. You want your people to be innovative, right? Remember I shared the story of Ola? I did not bring Mind Valley to Dubai. Ola did. Now, in most companies, someone like Ola proposing to do an event here for 2,000 people they are taking on a lot of risk. You know, we didn't think we could get 2,000 people. 
In fact, I was giving a press interview and I said, we're expecting a thousand people. And Ola messaged me, Vision, what on earth are you saying? We're getting 2,000, don't ever lowball us again. Now, the reason for that, the reason why my employees can take risks like that is because at Mindvalley, we adopt a lesson from Larry Page of Google, and it's called the 50-50 rule. And it simply means this. In all of our divisions in the company, 50% of your goals must have a 50% chance of failure. Let me repeat, if you have four goals, two of those goals must be a coin flip. So here's an example. This is the actual OKRs, objectives and key results for a search uh, engine optimization blog article writing team in Mindvalley. And you will notice that two of those goals have a star on it. Those two means they are stretch goals. The star goals means these are goals where even if we try super hard, there's a 50% chance of failure, but we're gonna do it anyway. Now, as a result, at Google and at Mindvalley, a good team will never ever hit 100% of your goals. If you're hitting 100% of your goals, let me tell you, you are playing too small. At Google, 40% of their projects fail. That's public data from the book in the Plex. At Mindvalley, again, 30 to 40% of our projects fail. A good team will only achieve 70 to 80% of their goals. If you can create your teams like this, you're gonna create more people like Ola Abbas in your company. Now, it isn't just about your teams, it's about your life. I expect to only achieve 70% of my goals. If I was hitting 100% of my goals, I'm playing way too small. Remember Bob Proctor's quote? Ask not, are you worthy of your goal? Ask, is your goal worthy of you? All of you should have goals that you are pursuing because they are fun, you're not stressing yourself out, but you don't know if you're gonna hit them, but you're doing it anyway because you are worthy. Number four, set end goals that inspire your soul. So we spoke about goals, right? But here's the important thing about goals. Michael Beckwith says there are two types of wanting. There is mature wanting or immature wanting. Immature wanting is, oh, I saw that yellow Lamborghini in this, in this magazine, and I think I want to get that because it's going to make me feel pretty cool. Mature wanting is... I don't care about what I see in advertising. I care about the insights that come to me when I'm in meditation, or when I'm journaling, or reflecting, or when I'm having a deep, meaningful conversation with my mastermind group. Mature wanting is where you shut down the pressures of tradition. And by the way, advertising is a form of tradition. It's, a, it's the traditional idea that your worth is based on how much luxury items you own. As Sarah Madani said, tradition, is nothing more than peer pressure from dead people. So how much of your goals are coming from peer pressure? 65% of, of people in the Emirates are Indian. You've heard this joke about Indian families, right? In an Indian family, in an Indian immigrant family, you're either a doctor, a lawyer, an engineer, or a family failure. Pick one. That's an example of peer pressure. I became a computer engineer because I remember my grandfather telling me I should be rich like Bill Gates. I ended up working for Microsoft. I quit after 11 weeks because I was so frustrated. And I just wasn't happy with my job. I was actually following my grandfather's goal, not mine. Now, means goals and end goal. This is a very important lesson to learn. So many of us chase a means to an end. We, become an, we want to become an engineer. Why? So our parents are proud of us. So that we can have freedom. So that we can build something. But there are so many people like me who go into that only to find that the means mean nothing. Rather, you want to set end goals. End goals are a completely different levels of goal. End goals are the goals that really light you up. They are doing it for your soul and no one else. Sarah Madani's lesson was all about a woman who disregarded tradition to set her own end goals. So let's break down the idea. Means goals have a so in them. I want to become, I want to get into a good university so I can become a lawyer, so I can join a law firm, so I can have a great paying job, so maybe I can have freedom. America has 5% of the world's population, but 70% of the world's lawyers because that cultural narrative permeates American society because of law shows in the 90s like Ali McBeal and LA Law that glamorize law. But I can tell you, I worked in the US law industry 50% of American lawyers are clinically depressed. 
So all of these people who become lawyers are basically saying, I want to get a job where I have a 50% chance of hating my life so much, I need to live on, on depression medication. That is the danger of means goals. Now, means goals are also about confirming to rules, BS rules, rules from society, rules from tradition, but many of these rules no longer make sense. End goals are different. End goals are about following your heart. When you think about an end goal, you light up. You stay up at night thinking about your end goal. You stay up at night thinking about that place you want to go on holiday because you have freedom. But you don't stay up at night thinking about how exciting it is to be doing your LSAT exam. Next, end goals are often feelings, right? They are feelings that we want. Freedom, significance, being able to be creative. So many entrepreneurs set a means goal, I want to own a business, only to, wonder, only to realize that if you own a business, that could be a recipe for lack of freedom, for restriction, for significant stress. Rather set goals for, I want a life of freedom. I want a life where I feel creative. I want a life where my work is recognized. I want a life where I'm earning this much money and can stay in five-star hotels and have two months of vacation a year. Those are way better than saying, I want to be an entrepreneur. Entrepreneur is a means goal. Now, remember the double illusion trap. You're not setting the goal. You're chasing the feeling the goal gives you, but even then, you're chasing the assumed feelings. We spoke about this earlier. So the solution to this is the three most important questions exercise. You guys want to do this exercise with me? Okay. We're going to do a super fast speed round of this exercise. Now, how many of you here have done the 3MIQ before? Awesome. So all the amazing people in the audience have done it. Now, the three MIQ says this, there are three types of end goals in life. The first is experiences. Cradling your newborn baby in your arm is an experience, right? Being on stage, telling your first joke as a new stand-up comedian to 2,000 people is an experience. Being able to own a gorgeous apartment in the heart of Dubai is an experience. Experiences light us up. They are end goals in itself. You don't, you, you, it is, it is the pure expression of being human. Now, the second question is, how do you want to grow? Because growth is one of the things that gives us most fulfillment. So when you set goals for your new health goals or goals for the number of books you want to read a year, these are growth goals, goals to learn new skills. And the third question is, how do you want to contribute? How would you want to give back to the world? Each of these connect to each other. So you're going to make a list of three, and I'm going to give you one minute per list. You're first going to write down all the beautiful experiences you want in life. And then you're going to ask yourself, if I was this man or woman who has all of these beautiful experiences, how would I have needed to grow to get there? For example, you want to have a beautiful home in the south of Italy. Maybe one of the things you want to learn is how to speak Italian. Maybe you also want to figure out how to create passive streams of income so you can pay the mortgage on that home. Maybe you also want to learn how to grow your finances. So, growth, you derive it from your experiences. Now, the third one is also related. You want to ask yourself, if I was so lucky as to have all of these experiences and grow in all of these ways, how then do I contribute to the world? Why do you ask this question? Remember the concept of level four thinking, unity? You don't just want to be powerful or wealthy. You want to be powerful, wealthy, incredible, but doing good for other people because nothing else creates fulfillment than that. The Dalai Lama said, you want to be happy, make other people happy. So this is how, why the three most important questions fit so deeply into everything else we've been learning today. So let's start, right? If you have a piece of paper, you want to draw columns like this. Experiences, growth, contribution, EGC. You can also do this on your phone. Now, this paper is really powerful. I want to share with you a really crazy story. This is the 3MIQ sheet that Ronan Diego put together. You're going to see Ronan on stage today. He's an amazing speaker. He's also Ola Abbas's husband. But what you don't know is that Ronan was a skinny kid from Brazil who joined Mind Valley maybe around in 2013. And at a team retreat, he wrote this down. Have a super effective mind, have a center which people could learn to improve their relationships, give a TED talk, have a healthy, strong body, inspire people to follow their dream. He wrote all of this down. He had no idea how he was gonna do this. 
By the way, when you listen to the goals coming from your heart, one of the things that's going to happen is you will not have any idea how to get there. But write it down anyway, because when you're listening to your heart, it's plugged into something deeper, and the universe will find a way. Just trust me on this. I'm going to teach you how to accelerate this tomorrow. So Ronan wrote this down, and the coincidence has started. He ended up taking part in the Viper Challenge in Malaysia, a very tough race. Somehow. He came out number one out of 20,000 competitors. He got invited to give a TED talk in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. Hold your applause, because we're not even done yet. His TED talk was so successful, they, he was flown to Paris to give another TED talk, and then he decided to come back to the Mind Valley office and tell his boss, Vision, "Hey, I've been giving TED talks around the world. Can I give a talk in Mind Valley?" So I said, "Yes." I sat down and listened to this man speak, and I'm like, "You're brilliant." Do you want to lead health and wellness in Mind Valley? And Ronan started doing that, and then he produced his first program, then his second program, then his third program. Last year, for quarter one, he was the most watched teacher on Mind Valley. It wasn't me, wasn't Marissa, wasn't Shafali. It was this guy from Brazil, and you'll see him on stage shortly. Now we're not even done yet. This kid, Jason Campbell. Today, you may know Jason Campbell as the host of the Superhumans at Work podcast. But at one point, Jason was at a conference I was doing in Croatia. Now, this was his three most important questions. He wanted to teach entrepreneurship. He wanted to be a better manager. He wanted to become a world-class speaker. He wanted to build a team of employees. And Jason was actually the AB guy, so he was scheduling the slides and making sure that the music was running all right. And we suddenly had a speaker call in sick. Jason came to me and said, "Hey, Vision." Could you put me on stage? And I said, Jason, this is freaking A fest. It's for the world's best speakers. We just have Marissa here. Like you're not qualified. And he goes, but Vision, this is my three most important questions. And you, as our boss, said that you would always try to support us in achieving our dreams. <laughs> so he did the whole guilt trip on me, and I didn't have time to argue because I did not. I was too tired to get on stage. So I said, fine, go on stage. Don't you dare mess this up. Okay, whatever you do, just don't mess this up. So he goes on stage and he gets voted best speaker. And the next thing you know, Jason, Jason Campbell, is now ends up becoming an author on Mind Valley. He teaches a course on productivity on Mind Valley. He's spoken all around the world. He launched his own podcast, Superhumans at Work, and his new book, Selling with Love. And he now runs a team of people in、uh, in Bali. He lives in a villa in Bali. Running a team of five people. Jason's in the audience here. Jason, are you here? You want to raise your hand? There he is. Right. Okay. Now, when you when you get your three MIQ sheets, by the way, you can use it in groups. In Mind Valley, we call this a blueprint for the soul. So we take everyone's three MIQ and we stick it in a wall. Those of you who run a business, you should be doing this with your employees. It's going to change your business. Look, talk,、um, get. Look up Mind Valley for business, mindvalley.com business, because we help bis- companies with this. Really powerful stuff. When all your employees see each other's goals, they can come together through social discourse and co-elevate each other. There is no monopoly on dreams. Somebody can see Jason's goal or Ronan's go- goal and go, "Hey, I want that too." So we see this all the time. These are four employees who looked at that giant board of people's three MIQs and saw that they had a common goal to hike the Himalayas. So they just got together and did that. And things like this are so beautiful. When you take part in Mind Valley meetups around the world, you might find that you meet people here with common goals. Hike the Himalayas with them, if that is your common goal. Now, I believe that there's something magical about putting our goals from our soul down on paper. I believe if we put down goals which are means goals that are coming from the culture scape, the universe isn't going to support us. But our soul is plugged into the universe. When you put these goals down, magical things happen. And I've seen this in remarkable ways with kids. So that's Christina with our son Hayden. This was in 2014 at AFest. Everyone was doing the 3 MIQ, and Hayden said, "Hey, I, I want to do it too, right?" So not only did he do it, but we gave him a mic, and I asked him to share one goal in each category. So this is what a seven-year-old kid said. Under experiences, he said, "I want to learn all the languages in the world." Under growth, he said, "I want to build a flying car." And under contribution, he said, "I want to develop something to clean the air in Kuala Lumpur because our city Kuala Lumpur, the air is really, really smoggy." Now I forgot about this until recently. I was talking to my friend Peter. 
Peter was at AFES, and Peter said, do you remember what Hayden said? I thought it was so cool that a kid wrote that down, and then it occurred to me, my son Hayden today speaks five languages. I speak one, by the way. He speaks five languages. In November, I caught him reading a French classical book, and I'm like, when, when did you learn French? He goes, oh, just a few months ago. And now he's learning Cantonese. He's not speaking all the languages in the world, but he's now 15, and he's, he speaks more languages than most of you. He's not building a flying car, but Hayden is learning to fly a plane, and he's about to become the youngest pilot in his country. Flying vehicle. But don't clap yet. He hasn't figured out how to clean the air in Malaysia. So Hayden, try harder. But I believe that even at a kid level, children are plugged into their soul and they know what their destiny is. So try this with your kids. So there's a Mind Valley member who brought this to schools in India. And, and these, are, these are village schools. They don't even have four walls and, or a roof, but they are doing the 3MIQ. OK, so you guys ready to begin? One minute each. Now, here's how you want to do it. Why am I giving you one minute? Because your soul knows what it wants. All you got to do is relax and tap into your soul and start writing. If I give you more than one minute, you will start questioning yourself. You will say, hey, I want to visit Cairo with my family. And then you'll go, well, you know, what if Egypt is unsafe? I read that Istanbul is a way better place and maybe it's cheaper than Cairo. No, don't do that. Just go with whatever emerges from your soul. Are you ready? Okay, one minute, begin, down, begin writing now. Here are examples of experiences. What type of love relationships do you want in your life? What do you want your social life to look like? The friends, the people you spend time with, your weekends. What adventures do you want to have in the world? What are the places you want to visit and explore? The experiences you want to seek. Maybe it's paragliding. Maybe it's hiking the Himalayas. And finally, what environments do you want to be able to live in? You might write down, I want to be able to, to have a stay in a five-star hotel for one month every year. I want to be able to work from any spot on the planet and still be productive. Now stop, okay? Now we go on to the second question, growth. Now remember, you can go back to this exercise anytime, but for the purpose here, I want you to get started. Remember, rate of application. Ask yourself, to have all of these experiences, how do I have to grow? Start writing now. You can look at health and fitness. How do you want to grow in terms of improving the effectiveness of your body? You can look at your intellectual life. What are the things you want to study? How do you want to allocate, how much time do you want to allocate to reading, to learning, to mind valley time? Look at your spiritual life. Maybe you want to take a particular spirituality program, like something by Joe Dispenza. Maybe you want to dive into a new mind valley course, like duality or the Silva method, and complete it. Maybe you want to set aside a 20 minute meditation or prayer practice every day. And finally, your creative life. Maybe you like creating music or art. What is it? How would you express yourself creatively? Okay, stop. Now we go on to the next one, contribution, the unity value. If you were so lucky and the universe blessed you and you were able to get all of these experiences and easily grow into this man or woman you want to be, how then would you help other people? This could be through your career, through what you're producing in your career. It could be your creativity. It could be through contribution to your family. It could even be through your community, maybe volunteering. Contribution is not just charity work or donations. Contribution is also creating services, products that give back to the world. When Ronan gets on stage and speaks about health and wellness, that is a form of contribution. When Ola steps up in her company and chooses to persuade the boss to take on a big project like Mind Valley in Dubai, that is also a form of contribution. You can really contribute through spreading wisdom or through giving to your company. Okay, now put your pens down. 
We won't have time to share this, but tonight at the party, when you meet someone, if you really want to get to know them, ask them for one experience, growth, or contribution that they put down today. And this is a really great way to immediately connect with someone. You never know who you're going to meet. You can also set an intention that you will meet the right person tonight to help you with one of the items you put down. In fact, do that now. Close your eyes. Set an intention. Just tell your mind, guide me to the right person tonight for a beautiful conversation that might help me move towards one of the goals I put down. Okay, open your eyes. So this is what you essentially did. You chose to ignore the dumb tweet that I shared earlier, that you only have to choose three categories of life and fail at the rest. Do not buy into that mon mental model of reality because it is so unworthy of you. Take a picture of this. These are 12 areas that you can look at in terms of improving your life and how they map to experiences, growth, and contribution. Okay? And it doesn't have to be these 12 areas. You can use any type of 12 area modality. So, we have spoken about mastering growth mindset. Your number one mission is growth, transformation versus knowledge, reframing failure, and vision and clarity. Tomorrow, we're actually going to go into one of the most important ideas of growth mindset, and that is the idea of identity shifting. You see, Michael Beckwith, the great philosopher who teaches on Mind Valley, said, the universe doesn't give you what you want. Rather, the universe will reflect back to you who you are. If you can find a way to pinpoint the beliefs in your head, pluck out the useless beliefs, and plug in new identities of who you are, incredible things will happen. Sarah had a new belief installed in her mind, a new identity that said, my body can eat anything I want, and I feel nurtured and nourished and not sick. But you can also plug in a new identity. I am a confident man or woman. I am a thriving entrepreneur. I live a life of freedom. I only work when I choose to work. I have a healthy body that gets better every year, even though I'm in my 50s. Identities are important because this whole thing about the law of attraction is kindergarten stuff. We don't even talk about it much at Mind Valley. The universe doesn't give you what you want. It will reflect back to you what you believe about it. And what you believe about it is your identity because you are plugged into that universe. But we'll explore this topic tomorrow. Thank you guys. Have an amazing time tonight.